The Mennonite tradition has long chosen their pastors by lot, following the biblical example that you heard uh, Coco read in this morning's text. So when West Linden Mennonite Church went to choose their pastor, the search committee put forward the names of the two final candidates to the congregation. And it was decided that instead of using lots to make the selection, the two finalists would compete at the congregation's June picnic in a potato sack race. Really, <laughs> the winner would become the new pastor. Mr. Froese, Froese beat out Mr. Duick, and one elder said of Mr. Duick, he should have spent more time, less time on his theological studies and more time on his potato sack racing skills. I'm sure that our search committee is considering this method. Frank Epp in his book, Mennonites in Canada, says that often using lots to choose the pastor didn't work out. So it was widely practiced that the bishop would remove from the list of candidates the names of clergy that he thought might not be best for that congregation to consider. It seems not everyone got to race in the potato sack competition after all. The use of lots I know seems rather odd and perhaps even hazardous to us. But in first century Judaism, the use of lots to make a decision was seen as both powerful and as highly respectable. And it's no wonder that Peter decided this was going to be the best method for deciding who replaced Judas as the 12th member of Jesus' disciples. One should also note that they prayed before they made the choice. And prayer they believed, as you heard, guided them in this decision. It was not random. God was seen to be guiding them to that right person. But what's also possibly the most intriguing part, I think, of the whole story from Acts is that Matthias, who was the person chosen by Lot to replace Judas, then disappears from the Bible and disappears from the annals of history, which has led naturally enough to this amazing collection of stories of what then happened to Matthias. The strongest speculation is that he went to Ethiopia and led the church there. But there's also a belief that his bones are buried somewhere in Germany. Now, my bones will be buried in the Bell's Corners Union Cemetery in the event that you want to venerate them or not. Don't out of hand discount what randomness can do in making a choice. And Matthias is the new disciple. One of the great musical bands of all time, U2, was formed when someone put up a notice on the signboard at Mount Temple High School in Dublin, looking for people to start a band. And six people showed up at the first practice. Two left after the second week, and the current U2 band is made up of the four remaining people who answered that notice board ad. The crisis in the United Church at the moment, which really doesn't get much play, but which every congregation searching for a minister knows full well, is that there are some 400 vacancies across the church at the moment, and somewhere around 100 people a year coming into ministry to fill those positions, which leaves a massive gap. As Reverend Alan Hall, the head of employment services for the church, says, half of all current United Church clergy are between the ages of 55 and 65, half. And an astonishing 85% are over the age of 45. Now in Ottawa, we are blessed with an abundance of excellent licensed lay worship leaders like Jeannie. But in many areas of the country, like northern Ontario or southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan, there are simply no one to fill the vacancies. And at the last meeting of our general council, they came pleading, I mean pleading,
for help. We have tried what are called circuit riders. We have tried regional ministers. We have tried training local people. We have tried amalgamations. And almost nothing has really addressed the issue. And honestly, we're far from solving this crisis. It may come to choosing lots. The person who pulls the short straw is the minister for the rest of the year in your pastoral charge. A recent article documented the fall of church participation in Quebec, which in 1950s was a deeply religious society, with some estimates suggesting that 90% of the population attended Mass each week. And today, that number is around 1% to 2% of the population attends Mass in Quebec each week lower than even in Europe. One commentator on the current state of the church entitled this lecture, It's Not Your Mother's Church, and indeed it isn't. Over the last 50 years in Europe and North America, the ground has shifted under us, radically shifted. And I honestly don't think it's anyone's fault. The culture has changed so radically and permanently, it was unlikely, despite what some may say, that we could have ever hoped to survive as the church did in my mother's day. And with this radical shift has come a shift in our leadership. Finding that Matthias today is a difficult task, whether you use lots or not. And what goes unspoken in this morning's text is that deep wound which the early church and the other disciples knew and felt from Judas' actions. They had been a tight-knit community, and from in their own midst arose this person who had been with them from the beginning and yet betrayed Jesus and betrayed them. And Peter felt that as he called the community together and advised them they should replace Judas as the scripture had called, because that wound might eat into the mission which he and the other disciples had been given by Jesus. At the heart of this story is trust. Peter and the others trusted that God would indeed raise up a new disciple. Peter and the other disciples trusted that through prayer, God would lead them to the right choice. And indeed, for us, there are times and decisions that we must all make when we don't know what the right answer is, what the best solution may be. And we need to lift it up in prayer and to trust. On the Sunday when I left Trinity United Church, I had found this children's book story about two friends, one of whom was moving away. And the friend who stays is sad as he waves goodbye. And then his mother says to him, let's go inside. I have a big cake for all of us to eat. So I told the children that Sunday morning that it was my last Sunday and I was sad to leave them. But there was a big cake in the main hall for all of us to have a piece of after the worship service. And a 10-year-old boy sitting beside me, right beside me, was pretty happy about this. And he yelled into my microphone, you ministers ought to leave more often. Thanks be to God. Amen.